Welcome to Batavia, Ohio, where history comes alive through its rich railroad heritage. Today, we'll be exploring one of the most iconic railroads in the area, the Norfolk and Western Railroad. So, hop aboard and let's begin our journey through time. Established in the late 1800s, the Norfolk and Western Railroad played a vital role in connecting Batavia with neighboring towns and cities. Its tracks stretch miles and miles, carrying both passengers and freight throughout the region. As we venture into the past, notice the remnants of old railway stations, once bustling with activity. These stations were not only gateways to other destinations, but also bustling hubs of commerce and social interaction. Imagining the passengers waiting anxiously for the arrival of their loved ones or the excitement of embarking on a new adventure is genuinely mesmerizing. Please note that some of the footage provided is a compilation of old videos across Ohio and other parts of the U.S. As well, the vintage photos are from Claremont County and are courtesy of various photographers, including newspaper clippings. Focusing on the tracks, you might notice the well-preserved rails that have stood the test of time. Each sturdy rail tells a story, a narrative of progress, industry, and the relentless pursuit of connectivity. As the wheels roll over these iron arteries, they create a symphony of motion, connecting the past to the present. Along the Norfolk and Western Railroad, you can still witness vintage locomotives gracefully gliding through the countryside. These historic engines evoke a sense of nostalgia, reminding us of the bygone era of steam-powered transportation. Take a moment to appreciate the craftsmanship and engineering marvel behind these magnificent machines. The Batavia Norfolk and Western Railroad has been a historic icon in Claremont County history. As told by Ron Hill, a local Claremont County, Ohio, historian and writer, the development of the steam locomotive and the construction of railroads changed life in the United States and Claremont County. During the 1800s, most people only traveled a short distance from their homes in their lifetime because of traveling by horse and the deplorable condition of the roads. The railroads opened up a whole new mode of transportation that increased their mobility. The first railroad in Claremont County, 1841, was the Little Miami Railroad that connected Cincinnati and Xenia. It served the northwestern side of the county, primarily Milford and Loveland. In 1876, Samuel Woodward conceived the idea of a railroad serving the central part of Claremont County. He approached the leading citizens of Batavia and convinced them a railroad would be advantageous and profitable. The Cincinnati, Batavia, and Williamsburg Railroad Company was incorporated, and construction began that year with Batavia as its headquarters. Later the same year, the name was changed to the Cincinnati and Eastern Railroad, with the terminus being Portsmouth, not Williamsburg. The narrow gauge railroad opened for business from Batavia Junction, later called Clare, near Plainville Newtown to Batavia, a distance of 16 miles, in March 1877. The original wood depot at Batavia was replaced by a brick structure, the only one on the line, in 1896. The railroad crossed the East Fork Little Miami River at Batavia on a 320-feet wooden Howe truss bridge. This bridge was the location of a train disaster in 1884. To be discussed later. Once across the river, the tracks climbed the Batavia Hill out of the valley. C.P. Tracy, an employee of the railroad, noted, the Batavia Hill had the worst grade and alignment of any section of the entire railroad, and stock cars loaded with tan bark had turned over on every section on every rail length on the hill. I do not know the exact grade, over 2%, but I recall that it was steep and the locomotive at that time was unable to pull more than 5 or 6 loaded cars up the hill, and it took all the brakes on the locomotive and cars to keep the train from running. Off down it. In 1897, the problem was corrected with the Maywood cutoff. The cutoff took 18 months to construct, and the resulting grade was 1%. The current railroad follows that line. O.C. Knight, who worked for the railroad from 1887 to the 1930s, described the early days of the railroad. Equipment was minimal. Both freight and passenger cars were small, with a capacity of 20,000 pounds and coaches of about 40 passengers. Coaches were heated by coal stoves, one at each end of the car, and lighted by lard oil lamps. All braking was done by hand, air brakes were not yet invented, the speed of passenger trains was about 20 miles per hour when no livestock was on the track. 
If there was, it was often necessary to stop the train and drive the animals off by heaving lumps of coal at them. Engine water tanks had to be filled with water from creeks and ponds with a two-man hand pump by the crew. Over the years, the gauge of the track changed three times, the name changed several times, and it went into bankruptcy four times. In 1877, the railroad built a line from Batavia Junction to New Richmond. The Norfolk and Western took over the railroad in 1901. For years, the railroad only ran to Batavia Junction. Passengers had to change to the Little Miami Railroad to reach downtown Cincinnati. In time, the NNW made agreements with the Pennsylvania and BNO railroads to run over their tracks. In 1982, the railroad became the Peavine branch of the Norfolk and Southern System. The Peavine branch was closed to Portsmouth in 2003 because the bridge over the Scioto River at Portsmouth was unsafe. The section from Cincinnati to Winchester remained open for limited use. The wooden bridge across the Little Miami River was replaced by a steel bridge in the early 1900s, which is still used today. In 1940, the NNW and the county built an underpass for West Main Street adjacent to the depot. The depot was raised 16 feet and rebuilt. In the early days, four trains, two east and two west, passed through Batavia each day. Trains left Cincinnati at 8 a.m. and 4.30 p.m., arriving in Batavia 112 hours later. The westbound trains to Cincinnati left Batavia at 7 a.m. and 4 p.m. The railroad helped fuel the Batavia economy. People, mail, and goods flowed in and out of the village by rail. The depot was a center of village activity. Presidential candidates spoke there. Santa came to town by train. Soldiers from the National Guard boarded the train for World War I, World War II, and the Korean Wars. For years, the Batavia Elementary first grade class took a field trip to MT Arab by train. Famous NNW steam locomotives passed through the village, the Pocahontas, Powhatan Arrow, and the Cavalier. Several train derailments have taken place in recent years in the Batavia area. In 1975, 13 cars of a 17-car train derailed at the base of a steep incline near Arian Road. A NNW camp car was pushed off the end of a siding near the depot and fell onto Main Street below in 1981. A track load shifted on a flat car, resulting in the car dangling from the overpass on SR 132 in 1989. Luckily, no one was injured in any of these mishaps. This was not the case 1884, when the bridge across the East Fork Little Miami River collapsed with a passenger train on top. The most famous wreck on the Norfolk and Western Railroad, then called the Cincinnati and Eastern Railroad, in Claremont County occurred on October 17, 1884, when the bridge across the East Fork River at Batavia collapsed, dropping the locomotive and two cars into the river. One car remained precariously balanced on the edge of the bridge, as shown in the steel engraving that appeared in the Harper's Weekly. It is best to report the activities in Batavia that day by reproducing the front page article in the Claremont Courier. The article also is an example of the newspaper writing style of that time. More than a thousand people, men, women, and children, stood on the banks of the East Fork last Friday at dusk, regarding with dismay and horror the wreck of the railroad bridge, which spans the creek at the edge of the village and the ruins of the evening train, beneath whose weight the spindling, corncob structure, undergoing transformation to a standard gauge, had given way at about six o'clock. The train consisted of a locomotive, a baggage car, a smoker, and a ladies' car. The engineer, Mr. Ed Wilbur, was making the dangerous passage with the utmost caution. Still, the strain proved too much, and with a premonitory groan, like that given by a falling tree, the bridge and train went down in an appalling crash, a sheer fall of 60 feet to the water below, averaging a depth not to exceed two feet. The citizens, at their evening meal, heard the awful sound and knew by intuition its terrible meaning. In an instant houses and stores were deserted, and the lonely river road at once became a scene of bustle and confusion, lighted by lurid fires and flashing lights, an exciting scene where men, breathless with their exertions to reach the bridge in time to save human life, gave vent to quick exclamations and plunged into the stream to grope among the shattered cars, half hidden by masses of splintered timbers, and entangled in a network of bent iron rods, and broken rails, but two vehicles left. 
the bridge the baggage car and smoker. The first contained, in addition to the passenger's baggage, the safe of the Adams Express Company, the mail, the luggage, master, the express agent, and four section hands on their way home to wife and babies, and supper and rest. All of these were more or less injured. In the smoking car were some 20 passengers. The ladies' car contained some 8 or 10 passengers, all of whom escaped without injury, the vehicle marvelously becoming fouled on the very verge of the breach, where it now hangs in mid-air, as it were by a thread, standing at right angles with the track, two-thirds of it hanging threateningly over the wreck, downstream, the balance projecting from the upstream side of the bridge, where it is transfixed by heavy timber. The work of removing the dead and wounded proceeded rapidly. The fireman, Henry Jones of Newtown, was taken up by a mass of mangled fragments. Under the engine, hissing with the escaping steam from her boilers and the action of the water upon her fires, with his hand clasping the throttle with the tenacious grasp of duty unto death, a heavy iron bolt piercing his throat, with glistening bones protruding here and there through the flesh that but an instant before was aglow in health, now bruised and torn, bloodless, broken dead, laid poor Wilbur, the engineer. Carriages and wagons furnished with mattresses and bedding were in readiness to convey the wounded to quarters where they could be made comfortable, and the dead were taken charge of by Measer Sterling and more. As the injured were taken from beneath the ruins by the men, they were received on the bank by the women, who revived them with cordials and cheered them with words of sympathy and encouragement, turning away their faces to weep but turning presently again to smile incongruously through their tears as they wiped the trace of agony from the brow of some poor sufferer. The approaches to the bridge along the road an hour after the disaster looked like an entrance to a battlefield, along such portions of the fences, as had not been removed and thrown upon the fires, were fastened saddle horses and horses attached to vehicles, while men with bandaged heads and limbs were passing to the rear of carriages and on foot, some being too much shocked and unnerved to trust themselves to the further services of wheels. The hotels were speedily converted into hospitals, and doctors and druggists were kept busy ministering to the wants of the wounded. The telegraph and telephone carried the news of the tragedy to all parts of the country. All night, a stream of carriages and horsemen poured through the village, conveying visitors to the disaster scene. It is estimated that over 5,000 people have visited the locality. Since changing the bridge from narrow to standard gauge began, necessitating the removal of comparatively substantial work, the structure has been regarded with grave fears by our people and others acquainted with the condition. That which has proven a false economy suggested the use of the old iron rods in the new work, a step that involved the removal of the rods, carrying them to a blacksmith shop for reduction in length, etc. The irons thus removed were replaced to an extent by timbers and scantlings, which proved but sorry substitutes. The wiser plan would have been ferriage until the completion of the bridge, but which, possibly owing to limited rolling stock, was not adopted. Wrecking trains are now at work among the ruins, and soon, all external traces of the disaster will have been obliterated. But the hearts of mothers and wives will long be sore, and the eyes of little children will ache and grow humid watching for the sturdy breadwinners who will never come home. The article goes on to list the names of the two men killed, the twenty persons injured, a couple of them died later, and the eleven who were not injured. Visit Norfolk and Western Railroad to read more about the railroad. As we conclude our journey, we invite you to appreciate the rich history ingrained within Batavia, Ohio's railroad legacy. These historic Norfolk and Western tracks remind us of the pioneers who built the foundation for the vibrant community we know today. Thank you for joining us, and subscribe to our channel to discover more fascinating stories like this one.